and be so interested about my book, but I want to excuse again all the mistakes that I'm going to do in, in English. Sorry, it's not my first language. And the second excuse is that I see a few people here that heard me yesterday. And I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that they will be boring to hear it again. I will try to change a lot of things, okay? That uh, the people that were yesterday will not uh, be too much uh, tired with my uh, explanation, description of the Jewish known people. Now, as Bertel told you, I'm teaching history in the Tel Aviv University. Uh, Jewish history is not my uh, field. In a long time that I was working about the natives in France, for example, and also the natives in Germany. In, uh, in one day I decided uh, to question the natives in Israel, I mean the Jewish in Israel. And this is the, the book, this is a product of my, uh, my questioning the Jewish present in the history. Now, I wrote the book after I got the f uh, full professorship because I was sure that if I will write it before it, there is well, not any chance to become a full professor. Not only in Tel Aviv, I believe also in NYU it wasn't sure that I could be. It's not a joke. Now, I wrote the book after I understood that uh, nobody can touch me really in an uh, academic point of view. Now, it wasn't my field. Then at the beginning, I didn't know exactly what I'm going to do. There were a few questions, a few things that bothered me a lot as a historian of other fields. I have to explain you that I'm not a historian of the Jewish people because we have in the Tel Aviv University a special department of Jewish history. I belong to the department of general history that is occupying with all the boys, but not about the Jewish. I have not any right to direct somebody in thesis to, to write uh, scientific articles or books about Jewishness. Why? Because I don't belong the, to the department of Jewish history. By the way, the department of Jewish history, a little department with 12 uh, students, I think, this year, we have uh, 120, uh, this department, uh, all of the professors there are Zionist professors. It's very natural. By the way, it's all the universities in Israel has two departments separately, co completely separate. Okay? Then it's not my subject, it's not my field, it's not my uh, right to write about Jewish history. I decided to write it because, you see, I thought that uh, Jewish history is something very, very interesting. Very interesting. In the way people write about it, I didn't like. But I don't hide. But I decided to write this book also because I am an Israeli citizen. That living in Israel in the beginning of the 2000 years, in seeing around me a kind of, uh, how we call it, images of the past, and I'm speaking now as, like as a citizen, images of the past that worried me a lot. For example, to explain it clearly, I believe that you know, more or less, at least a part of you, that you are not a direct descendant of the Anglo-Saxon. You know it? In France, for example, people know today, the beginning of 2000 year, that they are not direct descendant of the Gauls, you see? But, hundred years ago, most of the Americans uh, believed that they are the, the direct descendant of the Anglo-Saxon that came here, you know, a long time ago. Now, between, and it, this is very interesting, between Israelis, 95% uh, or even more are sure that they are the direct descendant of the people of the Bible. But it's not only the Israelis. I think that the Jew, most of the Jew in the world, at least in the Western world, are sure also that they are the direct descendant of the old Hebrew. 
even in this room, I believe, there are people that more or less think that they are, you know, the children, not of God, but of the Bible, no? I started to write the book because I have questions around the concept like what is a people, what is a nation, what is nationalism, what is a nation state, and other things. By the way, the first chapter I am dealing with this concept. Then if somebody is starting to read the book, you can jump on this chapter. It's the most abstract, most difficult. And I didn't succeed in this chapter really to be simple as the rest of the book. Okay? Don't be afraid. This chapter is difficult. Jump on it. And then it becomes much more narrative. You see, it will take you forward. Now, starting with a simple thing, with a concept like people. Yes? It's not a scientific term. But what we mean usually when I say, we say American people? Most of you belong to the American people? Yes, no? No, you. You come from Israel. No. New York is my country. Okay. No, it's, uh, you know, it's very interesting. They started to, the people started to decompose in some way in the beginning of our, the new millennium. But, but, you know, using the word American people, French people, Italian people, see? It's useful. What we are meaning by saying Italian people? We are speaking about a group of human beings that are speaking the same language, more or less, has the same way of life, more or less, are eating the same food, more or less, have the same music, more or less, etc., etc., etc. Practic and norm, culturally practic and norm, common to this society that we call Italian people. If it's true to use Italian people, French people, German people, American people, how can I use the word Jewish people? You understand me? Because, you see, if I have a cat and a dog, I cannot start to, to call the cat dog. You agree with me? Because if I would call the cat dog and the dog dog, I didn't know to who to call. No, it's not so simple. You have to understand. Jewish people, it means what? They don't have a language common to all. They are not speaking the same language. You see, I'm from Jewish origin. I imagine that there are other people here from Jewish origin, not? Yeah. A lot of you. Yeah. Can I speak in Hebrew now? <laughs> you know, I'm very good at in Hebrew, really. At least, can I speak in Yiddish? Not at all. No. Okay. I have to speak your language. Okay? English. <laughs> it was an option once when I was young. You see? I believe that we can arrive to it. Why Jewish people? Not a language. Not a food. We are not eating the same food. You see? By the way, in Israel we are eating hummus. You know what is hummus? I went in London to a restaurant, an Israeli restaurant, and I see hummus falafel. But it's not really Jewish. We steal it from the Palestinian like we stole the land. You know it. <laughs> now, not food, not language, maybe music. Yes, but the Doors music is not a Jewish music. I like the Doors, the Beatles. Unfortunately, it's not Jewish, okay? for the moment. Uh, now, what, what, what will we mean, Jewish people? If it's not a secular culture common to the Jew, it's difficult to speak in modern terms about the people. Don't forget that before the modernity, the word people was applied to a lot of things, quite differently than they use today. All the uh, Middle Ages, the word people was applied to, to religious group like the Christian people. You heard about it? God's people in England. Very common to speak about God's people. The Englishmen were the God's people, you know? Peuple de Dieu for the French. I mean, the world people designed religious group. In the Bible, the Bible is a but not the modern connotation. You understand me? 
Then why Jewish people? Ah, there is other reason why to use the word Jewish people. This deep belief that the Jewish came from the same origin. They came from where? From Palestine, no? 2,000 years ago, the Romans expelled the Jewish from Palestine. And they, uh, they started to wander in the world, you know, create a diaspora, arriving to Moscow, making a U-turn, return to their land in Palestine, Israel. This is the, you know, the, the kind of way that I studied history from the beginning till the last year. Ten years ago, I believe that the Jew, me, as a Jew, I'm a descendant of these people that were exiled 2,000 years ago. Everybody in Israel believed it, and I think also here, people more or less thinking that the Jews were exiled 2,000 years ago, no? And they has, they has more or less, not a pure race, but more or less they are from the same, you know, uh, ethnic, ethnos, okay? I started to write the book after thinking about concept from the beginning. I think that the Jewish are not, have not exactly the same origin and I didn't understand why I have to continue to use the, the word Jewish people. And I thought that uh, Jewishness is a religion, first of all, a very important religion in the Western world. When I started to speak with my students about it, it wasn't so simple. But we are a Jewish people, how come? The first basic in the 19th century to create a Jewish people, the first basic was the Bible. I noticed that the first part of the 19th century, Jewish first historians in the modernity in the 19th century consider Jew as religious community. Only in the second one of the 19th century appear the first historians to use Jewish people in a modern sense. It means that the question when the Jewish people were invent was invented, it's a long time ago, 140 years. It's a long time, no? 140 years that the Jewish people was invented. By the way, the French people it was 200. The German people is 250. But it's not bad, 230, 240 years that the Jewish people exist as a concept. Now, in the modernity, to create nations, intellectuals invented to the past people. Understand? To invent a French nation, it was necessary, eh, sorry, to create a French nation, it was necessary to invent a, a French people till uh, the beginning of the time, till the goal or till Clovis, for hundred years, little Frenchmen studied that they are the right descendant of the Gauls. Nos ancêtres les Gaulois was the first sentence in a lot of uh, uh, books, history books in the schools. Nos ancêtres les Gaulois, notre I say, notre ancestor, ancestor Le Gaulois. Jews started to write the history of the Jew from the Bible. My first chapter, after the theoretical chapter, is dealing the way that these intellectuals of the national intellectuals of the second half of the 19th century took the Bible as a basic to tell the history of the Jew as a people. And it was a new thing to do. You have to know that the Bible, that is not a book, it's a library, was not read by Jew. Everybody believes that the Bible is the book of the Jews, no? More or less? The first tes testament, not the second one. But do you know the du Jewish in their, uh, in their yeshivas, in their uh, rabbinic schools, 
didn't stu uh, study the, the Bible. They didn't read the Bible. Jewish didn't read the Bible. They have the right to read the Bible. Who read the Bible before the modern times? It was a very, very important Jewish sect that the name was Karait. You know what is Karait? Karait. I think that in English we're saying Karait, no? Karaitis. Karaitis is a very important Jewish sect. I don't know if they call it Jewish sect, a monotheist sect in Jerusalem, very, very strong. And they read the Bible as the first book of their identity. The second group that read the Bible before modernity was where? Who? Huh? Protestant. They jumped on the Bible as the beginning of their religion. Because they are the really children of Israel. You know, the Protestant. You know it. I believe that there are people here really children of Israel from Protestant origin, no? I don't see very clear, but I believe. I don't know how to define somebody that is a real Protestant. <laughs> in, even, even a Jew, I, can, I don't arrive to, to identify immediately. Now, the Protestant were the uh, second group that read the Bible. The third one was the Zionist. In the second half of the 19th century, at least from the end of this century, Zionists started to read the book, not as a theological book, but as a historical book. You see, all my education passed in Israel. From the, when I was uh, seven years old, I studied the Bible in a secular school, not in a religious school. I studied the Bible as what? As a history. History of my people the Jewish people. You can imagine it, from seven years old till the degree of the high school in the end, in 18, everybody in Israel is studying every week before the English language, before mathematics, before history. It is the Bible. By the way, last, in last year, they decided to start it in six, in the first class, to be sure that people will know that they belong to the Jewish people. A month ago, I read that they thinking to put the Bible in the kindergarten. <laughs> they don't know to read, but we can read before them who they are. You understand? It's very important. Especially in this world that national identity, national culture started to de be decomposed. Then it's be much more true to, to read the Bible to, ki to children in the kindergarten. It's not a joke, by the way. They didn't decide yet if to do it in the kindergarten or not, but it's very near to happen. Now, the Bible became the basic of the history of the Jew. In the 90s, I mean, uh, more or less 20 years ago, Israeli archaeologues, archaeologists, this is a New York accent. I have an Israeli accent in English. An archaeologist, okay? Israeli archaeologist, the good Zionists, started to discover that a lot of things in the Bible, most of the things in the Bible, are legend and has not a real historical basic. I will not come in too much, but because if I'm telling all the book, you will not buy it. By the way, you can wait to the paperback, no? Not to okay. I used to buy always paperback. No, but I'm <laughs> sorry that I said it. Anyway, uh, Israeli diggers of the land of Israel discover that the exod, the famous exod of the Jew, exodus, exodus of the Jew, going out from Egypt, didn't happen. The exodus didn't, didn't happen. It's terrible, no? You know why it's terrible? Very difficult for everybody? The, there is Pesach. You know it is Pesach. In this holiday, very important Jewish holiday, you can imagine that exodus didn't exist? Why to make this holiday in Pesach? 
Now, not only the exodus, by the way, there is a, a lot of reasons that were proved the exodus couldn't be. I can, in my book, I, I come into details, but you have to understand, the exodus supposed to be the 13th uh, cycle before Joseph's Christ. Okay? 13. In that time, the Egyptian empire exists also in Canaan, Canaan? Canaan. Canaan. Then Mo Moses took out the Jew from Egypt to bring them back to Egypt. Because Canaan was Egypt. You understand that? The David and Solomon kingdom didn't exist. It was a little, little, teeny kingdom around Jerusalem of David. Maybe. But it showed that it wasn't a kingdom unifying Israel and Judah together, great one, like it's the script in the Bible, that is telling in the Bible. Anyway, the Bible lost a lot of credibility because of our archaeology, archaeology in Israel. I started the book trying to confront, confront the, the, you know, all the, uh, all the document, new document about the Bible with the Zionism, the way that they built, they constructed the, Jew, uh, the Jewish national history. And I wanted to finish with it, to make a little book about it. And I remember the day that I started to, uh, to become interested in another chapter, very important, of constructing the national consciousness or national memory of the Jew, and especially of the Israelis. It was the exile. I'm sure that a lot of people sitting here are sure the Jews were exiled from Palestine after the revolt of 70, after the destruction of the Second Temple. No? Jews were exiled from this. Everybody knows it in Israel, in New York, especially in New York. <laughs> no? Sorry? You know, some people say that the exile happened in 70. The others say that the exile started in 135 in the revolt of Bakufa. Now, I started to dig a little bit the subject. And I discovered, to make it simply, because I see that there are people here that are interested about the subject and knows about the subject. The Israeli didn't, the, the Jewish didn't, the Romans didn't exile the Jewish from Judah. Now, you doubt about it. No. You think that the Jewish were exiled, no? Now, it's very interesting that I was looking for books, research books, that are speaking about the exile of the Jew. In the first century of Je after Jesus Christ, I didn't find even one book. You can imagine it. One of the most important event in the Jewish history didn't happen. The Romans didn't expel Jew from Judah. How come? How come? Not in 70, not in 135. No, I don't ask you. <laughs> I'm happy that you know something about it. Ah, then most Jewish were dead, but not exiled. Okay, okay. Most Jews were dead, but not exiled. Then exile didn't happen. They died. Sorry. Sorry? Now, uh, then I repeat, no exile, even one book, is not speaking about the exile of the Jew from Judah. Now, in the population, in the collective memory, even on our money in the pocket, it's written that we were exiled. We, the Jews, were exiled from Judah. You know, we have the 50 shekels. It's not 50 dollars, it's 10 dollars, I think. No? More or less. Our 10 dollars, there is the description of Agnon saying that we were exiled from Jerusalem, from Judah, by the Roman, by Tit, Titus? Titus. 
and everybody in Israel is sure that we were exiled from Judah. In Rome, there is a gate that you see there, the menorah there. You know the menorah? With people holding the menorah. When I was a child, in my textbook, it was written, in this gate in Rome, you see Jewish holding the menorah and going out to the exile. Three months ago, our Premier Minister Bibi Netanyahu went to Rome to, to meet his friend Berlusconi. A good friend, by the way. After meeting Merosconi and all the girlfriends and all this, he came to the gate. He came to the, no, it's not a joke. He came to the gate. He took a photo with the gate like this. And it was written in the journals that uh, he was, he is standing near the gate that showed that the Jewish people were exiled from Israel, from, from the land. Now, one of the things that I didn't notice when I was a child, that the guys that holding the menorah, don't have beards. And they have a very short robes. You know, like here, like here, it was very, very patient in the Roman soldiers. Very nice robes and without beard. Really, the Jewish has a beard, even in that time. So only the Romans didn't have a beard. I am sure that Bibi Netanyahu in the photo didn't think about it. That the photo is about Roman soldiers taking the thing that they robbed from the temple and going it to Rome. Jewish were not expelled. A lot of them were killed. There is not numbers, but we know that most of the historians of the antiquity, most of the historians, exaggerate with numbers. I tried to show it, I will not come into the problem. You can put away one zero in all numbers of the uh, all the historians of the old time. One zero. No, mister. Not Shoah after the revolt. You know why? Because 65 years after the revolt of Bar Kokhba, Judah became the place the basic of one of the achievements, the most important achievements of the Jewish tradition, of Jewish ideologically, a Jewish religion. I'm speaking about the Mishnah. You heard about the Mishnah? A part of you, Mishnah. Before the Talmud, Mishnah, Mish ah, Mishnah, not Mishnah. The Mishnah, it was written 200 years. 65 years after the Bar Kokhba, one of the most achievement of Jewishness was product produced in Judah. Okay? And there is a lot of material today to show that even if the revolt was very, very difficult of Bakokhva, this fanatical revolt of Bakokhva, very quickly, in one generation, the country became flourished even before. That if the Jews didn't exile, what happened? Two questions were put before me. What happened with the population in plus? What happened with the Jew? Because they were not exiled, first of all. And how come there, there are so many Jews in the world? You understand me? Now, what happened with the Jewish in Judah? In Palestine, because we have to say Palestina after the Bar Kokhba uh, revolt. What happened with the Jewish in Palestine after the revolt? What happened with the Jewish during all these years? How come did the Jewish disappear from Palestine? You have an idea? I have. I started to look and I found in the writings of the first Zionists the answer. You don't know, I imagine, a lot about the first Zionist. For example, Israel Belkind, he's the first guy before Herzl that has a Zionist arrived to Palestine. Israel Belkind. You don't know the name. But you know David Ben Gurion? No? The young don't know who is David Ben Gurion? 
David Ben Gurion. David Ben Gurion. No, in New York it's David Ben Gurion. No? You know him. David Ben Gurion, with his friend Itzhak Ben Tzvi, wrote a book, a very important book about Palestine in 1919. By the way, it's very astonishing that they wrote it here in New York. They were exiled, by the way, by the Turk. And they wrote a fantastic book about Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. They, they are the first one that started to use in modernity the word Eretz Israel. Because all the Zion is called Palestina, you know. In this book, they gave the answer that I was looking for. They knew and they write, it's a mistake to think that the Jews were exiled. The Jewish stay in plus like all the peasants in the world. And the peasant in Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, are the direct descendant of the old Jew. If you don't believe me, buy the book. <laughs> I quote Ben Gurion, I quote Ben Tzvi, I quote Belkin to show at least till 1929 the most important Zionists believe that the Arabs there, the natives, are the real descendant of the old Jew. Astonishing, no? Bizarre, he said in French. You see, they try to, to make the, pa uh, the, paint, uh, the, paint, the, the picture of the Israeli people differently than later. They were a minority as has settlers and they wanted to recuperate the Palestinians as a part of the Jewish people. They, they, they spoke and they write about the Arabs in Palestine as a part of their flesh and blood. I mean, they had a concept that we need a same origin to become a people, but they considered the Arabs in Palestine as a part of their flesh and blood. Till the first Arab revolt in 1929 suddenly they discover that the natives don't want to be a Jew. <laughs> there was a problem. By, uh, by the way, I'm thinking that it's pity. Huh? If they accepted to be a Jew, it was differently now. Huh? We could have as Prime Minister uh, Azmi Bishara, maybe, I don't know. Or Ismail Aniya, the Prime Minister of Israel, who knows? Anyway, when I tried to expose this idea before a lot of Arabs, Palestinians, they didn't like the idea that they are the descendant, direct descendant of the Jew. <laughs> Especially the Hamasnik. Huh? It's not a joke, by the way. They didn't accept it so well. Anyway, I think that Ben Gurion was right. It's one of the points that I accept his ideas. I mean, he exaggerated a little bit because he wasn't a serious historian. I don't think that the Palestinians are the direct descendant of the old Jew. You know why? Because every conqueror passed there in this area and, less, and left his seeds in the place. They are mixed like most of the pup peoples in the world. I try to convince them that they will not start with the mythology, national mythology, that they are the real Jew. It will make a lot of problems, you see, diplomatically. And <laughs> No, it's fantastic. You can imagine to write a script about this? Yes. A family of Hamas discovered by the DNA, for example, that they are the old Jew. <laughs> now, the second question was if the Jewish were not expelled. By the way, I think that uh, the Palestinians are not the des direct descendant of the old Hebrew, but I think that the chance that the Palestinian in Hebron will be a descendant of the old Jew, it's a thousand times more than me. I mean, I think that the chance that he is a descendant of Palestinians is much more than most of us here. Jewish and not Jewish. Now, what happened? In the beginning of the 7th century, the Arabs arrived to Palestine. Jewish and Palestine exist this, this, that, uh, di till this time has a majority, more or less. A lot of them become Christian. 
but not all the population. It was a resistant, a very strong resistant to become Christian. You know why? Because a lot of people has a problem with the Son of God. You know, it's a, it, it's a kind of copio. You know, Christianity and, and Jewishness are very far from the theological point of view. It was very difficult to admit that the grace is the, was uh, was uh, descendant to to the uh, to the land to the earth. You understand me? It was very difficult for Jewish to become Christians. But with the Islam coming, the Islam, it was a happiness. This is the reason, for example, that I cannot support now when I'm living in Paris a little bit to hear. Notre civilisation judo-chrétien. You know, today everybody is speaking in Europe. We are judo-Christians. You hear them? Very popular. I don't understand. No, it's a very nice formula, but I read that they didn't use it, the French one in the 40s. It was nice, 1940, I mean, to become a judo-Christian before the Germans. Anyway. To say Judah Islamic is ma much more logic, you understand? A prophet came from the desert and said that he is the continuation of the other prophet. He is not the son of the God. They opened the Jerusalem, the holy city of the Jewish, before the Jew. You understand? The first time that the Jew could come into the holy city was with the Islam conquest. Not only this. You see, the first step of the conquest of the Islam, every guy that was converted to Islam was free of taxes. You heard about it? Was what? Was free of taxes. Taxes, taxes. taxes. Oh, he didn't have to pay taxes if he was converted to Islam. You can imagine it? They are coming. Tomorrow they will come to New York. They propose every person, every guy that will accept to be converted to Islam will be free of taxes. How many New Yorkers will accept <laughs> the Islam? <laughs> Thinking 76. 76. People become Islamic without knowing. Without knowing that they are changing religion. I'm, I, I'm speaking about a peasant. In this way, they become this peasant. After thousand years, the Palestinian, more or less. Now, what happened with the with the rest of the world? And this is important. Now, everybody of us in Me Too, eight years ago, I was sure that Judaism is a kind of close religion. They don't try to proselyte other people. No? You don't try to proselyte other people? No. No. You are seeking the Judaism in opposition to the Islam or the Christianity is not a proselyte religion. It's not true. From 200, uh, 200 years before Jesuit Creek, when the first time in my theory monotheism arrived to power in the western world I am speaking about the Maccabean one of the first things that this authority new authority of the Maccabean after the revolt of Maccabean one of the first things that they are doing is what? to convert by force all their neighbors they were not the the last monotheism that tried to convert by force, but they were the first one. And they convert a lot of people around them. And this is the reason that Hordus became the king of Judah in the end. You know who is Hordus? How we call it? Herodus. Herod. American guy. Herod. Okay. <laughs> We call him Orodus. Uh, sorry that I changed the name. 
didn't uh, know that he is living in New York. Anyway, the last Edomic king, it's a result of forced conversion that started in Judah 200 years before Jesus. And it continued. Jewishness was the first monotheism that converted people. And they convert a lot of people in the Roman world. They succeeded to convert families, slaves, because every converted family forced the slaves to be converted. In Judaism started to spread, spread in all the Mediterranean. But not only private families, not only slaves, kingdoms become converted. The first kingdom in the first century that were converted, it was in Babylon. Once I thought the Jewish of Iraq are the authentic Jew of, Fal of Palestine. Because the first exile, I was sure. You know, I have a lot of respect to them because of it. And suddenly I discovered it was a kingdom that was converted in this area. It's called in Hebrew Hadayev. How do you call it in English? Hadayev. Ad Adbayan? Ad Adbayan? Adbayan, I think. You don't know. You don't know Jewish history. <laughs> a very good kingdom. By the way, in the revolt of 70, they send people to fight with the, the Judean in Judah. It's the first kingdom, but not the last Jewish kingdom. In the 5th century, you know, you know more or less where is Yemen? Yemen? Yeah. It was a, exists there a very strong Jewish kingdom that lasts more than a Maccabean, Maccabean kingdom. Nobody in Israel today don't know about this kingdom that lasts 150 years, more or less. You can imagine? We love history, we, the Jew, the Israelis. We don't know, we don't teach about the Jewish kingdom in the 5th century. You know the Jewish Yemenite? The girls are beautiful, no? Handsome, no? Especially the hairs. How we call it? Curly. Curly hairs. It's very nice. I like it very much personally. <laughs> the curls of, the, of the, my student from uh, Yemenite origin. But it, this curls didn't come from the wind of uh, the Red Sea. You understand? The third kingdom was in North Africa, but uh, you know Judaism became very, very popular in North Africa. It started with, with the Phoenician, <coughs> it's continued with the Berber. And we, the Jew, was the last fighter against the invasion of the Arabs of North Africa. Who is new? Uh, us, the Jew. You know, it was a. a, a, a no, a queen, a very important queen. The name of this queen was Da'iya El Kaina. She was uh, the head of this military force that tried to resist in the name of Judaism against the Arabs that came to North Africa. Most of the Jews that came from North Africa are the Berbers. They don't like the idea. Not all, only this. I think that the invasion of Spain in 711, yeah? 711, the invasion of Spain was made by a Jewish barbarian with Muslim, Muslim barbarian, and this is the reason that so many Jews started, a, a Jewish community started to develop in Spain in the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries. From the beginning, it was a Jewish Muslim force that invaded Spain in the, eight, the beginning of the 8th century. The last chapter to discover from where Jews came is the case of Khazaria. 80% of the Jews in the beginning of the 20th century came from East Europe. 
Okay? More or less, 80%. How come? Why in this area there were so many Jews in the be beginning of the, of the 20th century? How come? The Zionist historiography tried to tell us that, you know, the Romans took the Jews from Judah, put them in Roma, they went up to Germany, they make a turn and to arrive to Poland. More or less, this is a story. And I ask myself, how come that there are so many Jews in Poland, Ukraine, and Russia? The only explanation can be the Kazaya case. I am speaking about a very, very important kingdom that started more or less to be Jew in the 18th, the 18th century. The 18th century. Eighth. Eighth. Okay, sorry, I started to be tired. Eighth century after Jesus Christ, this very, very large kingdom became Jew. What is the meaning of Jew? That a lot of people become Jew under the rule of the Khazarian. It was between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. You say Caspian Sea? Yeah. Today, but it was, the name of this sea was Khazarian Sea. In the Middle Ages, the name was Kazarian, after us. By the way, <laughs> sometimes I'm joking with my students and tell them, tell them, Jerusalem, you know, after the Bible, you will agree with me, was not built by Jews. You know. By whom? By the Yerusi. Jewish, not Jews. The children of Israel invaded Jerusalem. It was not built by Jew, but uh, maybe it's us, the Jew of the Europe, the last uh, Eastern Europe, that built Kiev. Kiev started to become a city under the rule of the Khazarian. Then if we didn't build Jerusalem, at least we have Kiev. <laughs> Think about it, it's fantastic. I don't give proportion to try to unify Kiev with Israel. It will make the conflict much more complicated. <laughs> but it's us that established Kiev. Till now, they, they have a gate, Kazarian gate, they have a quarter, a Jewish quarter in Kiev. By the way, the Soviet didn't like the idea that we build Kiev. Now, the, you know, Till more or less the 60s of the last century, most of the Zionist historians accept, accept the thesis that this massive presence of Jew in the Europe, Eastern Europe, came from the Kazarian areas. They only put forward also that it was Jewish from Eretz Israel that arrived to Kazaria. You understand? My last chapter, because I passed the time that you gave me. The last chapter, I'm leaving the, how we say, the long time of history and try to concentrate about Zionism, political Zionism, modern times. And also, I try to analyze the character of the Israeli state. I make it clear. Jewish nationalism, I mean Zionism, was born in the areas that German nationalism was born, Polish ja uh, nationalism was born, and they kept like the German nationalism till the 20th century, like the Polish nationalism till the 20th century. About when? Uh, more or less the second part of the 19th century. Zionism was born in the second part of the 19th century? Yeah. I'm speaking about N not the movement. For the movement, we have a date. But for the birth of ideas, of Zionist ideas, you have not one date. You understand me? But if you want, from the 70s of the 19th century, we can feel the movement, the, the birth of a historiography, a national historiography, a national ideas about a Jewish state. This kind of national. I mean Jewish nationalism, I mean Zionism 
has a lot of common with German, Polish, Ukrainian nationalism. A lot of common. Because being a true German, being a true Poland, Polak, Poland, Polish, no Polish. Paul, Paul, Paul. Paul. Being a real Paul, you have to to have parents, poor parents, German parents. To ha you have, to, you need to be uh, from the Totons. Mm. Toton. 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 No, you have to be a Toton. A real Toton. You cannot become a German, like you become American, like you can become a Frenchman. You have to born to be. Jewish nationalism has this characteristic that you cannot become a Jew, nationality. You have to be born by a Jewish mother or to convert, even if you don't believe in God. True or not? There are a lot of people that are converted here in New York without believing in God. It helped me, by the way. Sorry? It's fine? Yes, yes. Yes, it helped me. It helped me as a historian that has a lot of respect to Jewish religion. Now, Israeli state started in 47, 48. The basic of this state is not a, rep a, rep a republican principle. And I stress in my book that for, from 48 till 99, uh, to, uh, 2009, Israeli is, Israel is not a democracy. You agree with me, not? Yeah. Israel is a democracy? Yes, yes wonderful. No. Wonderful. Why Israel is a democracy? You know, democracy has a lot of definition. But you will agree with me that the first principle of a democracy is that the state belong to their to its citizens. The first before saying it's political pluralism, it's liberal, less liberal, the basic of democracy in modern times is that the state belongs to its citizens. Yes. True or not? Not true. Not true. Okay. No, no, you make a mistake. Sorry, before speaking, before speaking, it's very important to understand from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, that was the first one, that put the principle of sovereignty of people, the first one, passing the French Revolution, arriving to your constitution, the basic of democracy is that the state belongs to the, its citizens. The <laughs> <laughs> I'm speaking about theory. <laughs> now, it's another discussion. Israel from the beginning defined this itself as a Jewish state. A state that belongs to the Jewish people. Right or not? It means that this state belongs to Madoff, Joe Lieberman, a new, I, be, I think, I presume, more than student, Arab student, that working with me in Tel Aviv University. And they are Israeli citizens. I mean, people here in the room, the state of Israel, after a few laws in Israel, belong to them more than to a quarter of the population in Israel that is not Jew. Israel doesn't define itself as the state of the Israeli citizens. True or not true? They give the right of election to everybody, but you know, it's like this to William Carton saying you will never win in poker. You, you know the rule, the game. Now, what I'm insisting is Israel is not a democracy because Israel says that is a state of the Jewish people. Automatically, if you went to Israel, you can become, in a few minutes, 
a Israeli citizen. I, I, I spoke to my friend here sitting. Okay, I imagine that he is a Jew. No, I make a mistake. <laughs> okay, sorry. No, I think that we understand each other. No, you understand why Israel is not a democracy? It's clear, simple. Everybody is speaking about Israel a democracy. It's not a liberal democracy. No, it's a liberal country, my friend. The fact that I ca can be... One moment. No. Israel is a, a very liberal country, a liber very liberal state, in the fact that I am a professor on the Tel Aviv University. Till now. <laughs> no, it's very important. There is a political pluralism very deep in Israel. It is a liberal ethnocracy. It is a liberal ethnocracy. It isn't a liberal democracy. Every citizen in modern democracy has to know that the state belongs to him. That the good of the state is a good for him. In Israel, the good of the state is for the Jewish people. The good of the state is for you and not for the student. Arab student that I have in Tel Aviv University. A long time it was okay. They supported it. They were afraid because of the Nakba. You know what is the Nakba? The Palestinian tragedy of 48. They were afraid because the military regime till 66 that were op opposed on them in the 1950. But today there is a generation of young Palestino Israelis that stop to be afraid. Every step that they become more Israelis in their culture, in their language, they become more anti-Israelis in their politics. You understand that? They stop to support living in a state that pretend not to be their state when they were born here when I wasn't born there and you are not born there it will be finished badly I think Gaza is nothing what can happen in Galilee in the Galilee you know the part that looks like Provence in Israel <laughs> They are a majority in Galilee, the Arabs, Israelis. If tomorrow they decide to build their estate, by the way, my students start to speak about it. This is a Jewish state, it's your state. Okay, we'll go to build in Galilee a state of Arabs, but not of Arabs, a real state of their citizens. By the way, they proposed me to be the vice, minister, uh, the vice president. <laughs> They say that they are not racist at all. I don't know if to believe them or not. But they are going, thinking, to, s to make a Kosovo. You know why Kosovo happened? Because the Serbia regime started to be an ethnic regime, more and more. In the Kosovo, they are not really Kosovo, they are Albanian, you know. Albanian. But they don't want to belong to Albania. Most of my students don't, especially the, the female students, don't want to be a part of Ismailani regime. You understand? They will build in Galilee a state of their citizens. They are right from democratically point of view. This will start to be the end of Israel. Because Israel will not let Galilee become a, citizen, a, a state of, their cit of its citizens. You understand? It will be a mass murder, I'm afraid. It, it will be the end of Israel. A lot of Israelis feel today deeply the danger. This is the reason that Avigdor Lieberman got so many votes. You know who is Avigdor Lieberman? The, he, 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 we can call him Yvette Lieberman. A very nice guy. 
that was a, we say in, in French, videur de discothèque autrefois. Yeah, how we say it in English? Videur de discothèque. You know the guy that uh, throwing away from the discotheque, from the... Bouncer. How? Bouncer. A bouncer. A bouncer. No, he, he was walking as a bouncer. Now he want to bound out the Arabs from Israel, no? <laughs> because he is right. In his diagnostic, he is right. The Israeli are more afraid in their daily life from this phenomenon than from the Iran nuclear. Believe me. Now, Bertel asked me, I was afraid to come into it. One of the answers to my thesis in this book that the Jewish people doesn't exist, it's very important to know, one of the answers is in the biological level. You know that my university, there is laboratory that are looking for a Jewish DNA. You heard about it? No. They found it, yes! You can open the, you know, the internet, they found it. Yeah, they found it, a uh, Jewish DNA. <laughs> in my book, I try to, to deal with the question. In 2000 years, they found that the Jewish are in the world are very, very close to the Palestinian. You heard about it. One year later, the same, the same group said that it's not true. It's not the Palestinian, our brother. It was before the Intifada, by the way. They discovered that the Jewish and the Palestinian are very, very close from the DNA point of view before the Second Intifada, in the 90s when it was a peace. With the, the Intifada, the same group changed the conclusion, the biological conclusion, and said that Jewish are not close to Palestinian, they are close to the Kurd. 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 A nice family. No, really. I'm not against it. It's a bluff. I cannot come the, to details because I want to know what is, what is more, most important for you to, that I will continue. But one thing important is, in the internet, if you are looking, you will see that they call me the denier of the Jewish people. You know, it's very ch chic. A denier. It reminds you of something. Huh? There are denier of the Shoah, and suddenly came a guy that is denier of the Jewish people. It's very nice. But it's true. Not that I, I deny the Shoah, not at all. I am an enemy of the deniers of the Shoah. But it's true that deny, I deny not Jewish identity, not Jewish solidarity, not Jewish religion. I deny the Jewish people. Why? Because Zionism denied the existence of the Israeli people. Zionism, the Zionist colonization in Palestine, create two people. The Palestinian people and the Israeli people. I'm not always proud to the fact that I belong to the Israeli people, especially lately with the Gaza war. But Zionism succeeded to create a people, a nation there, a Palestinian one and an Israeli one. There is a language, there is a theater, there is a cinema, there is a literature, there is even a food, the hummus. But Zionism didn't, doesn't want to recognize the fact that they build a new nation. They treat these people, this nation, as a bastard. Unglorious bastard. If I am a denial of the Jewish people, Zionism is denial of the Israeli people and put in danger the existence of the Israeli state. Thank you.
Spielberg, or how would you think you translated into multimedia with the attention that it's received? I'm coming at you now with big contracts negotiating the option for the movie. They come with contracts, not big contracts. Not big. Okay. Not big yet. <laughs> you know, but there is uh, two groups of uh, filmmakers that uh, asked me uh, to, to try to make a, a film of a TV uh, series with this <laughs> subject. I prefer a TV series, you know, with every chapter. Has you a should insist on being... It's not a, yeah, it's two groups now that try. I, I don't know who is the serious one. Okay. Yes. person asked, said, didn't ask, that apartheid regime cannot be a democracy, first of all, in what is my position in face of the boycott of Israel, especially of the university on Israel. Now, you notice that in this conference, I, I didn't mention the occupied territories. I spoke about the characteristic of the Israeli state in the 67 borders. I didn't come in because the question of the occupied territories in Israel has intellectual issue finished. You understand me? It's finished. There is not real discussion, intellectual discussion. It's political and military. Israel will continue for a time to kill, to oppress people in the occupied territories. After 42 years that they don't have any right, political right, civil rights and other rights. <laughs> this you know. Okay, one moment, one moment. I didn't come to into the issue because I think it's not, uh, it's a very important from human point of view, political point of view, not from historical point of view. You understand me? 42 years, they hold the people without any rights. It's not the same attitude to the Israeli Arabs, the Palestinian Israelis. If you meant apartheid, the politics in the occupied territories, I agree. But you see, Israel is saying that he is not annexing juridically these areas. They are an occupied force in these areas. Right or not? Like the Americans in Iraq or in Afghanistan. With the colonies. But juridically, like you in Afghanistan. No? You, in Afghanistan, no? Now, I want to know, okay, about Iraq, you are saying that you are going away very soon, no? <laughs> I hope. But not about Afghanistan. In this week, you send 13,000 more soldiers to Afghanistan. You are not calling the United States an apartheid regime if they will be there even 50 years. There is apartheid, a clear apartheid in the occupied territories. The colonies has anything to do with the other population around. They have special roads, special houses, you understand? Completely separate from the population. They see the population when they come to build the houses. I agree that it is apartheid occupation. I agree also that there is a segregation in Israel. You know that we cannot marry non-Jew in Israel. You know it? Ah, one moment. Okay. You don't know? I can't marry a man here, so yeah, same thing. Wow, the same thing. I agree with you. you we have to fight that you can marry, marry the man. <laughs> Do you want to join me? to fight against the laws in Israel that in, don't let people 
from other communities to marry between them. You can imagine a democracy <laughs> that you cannot marry the non-Jew. And by the way, it's not because of the religious, because of the orthodox. It's one of the mistakes that a lot of people are doing. The decision to give the rabbis the right to marry people was taken in 47 when the majority was of secular people but not sure about their identity. They needed the criteria, criteria, criteria. criteria of the religious criteria to define who is a Jew, who is a not Jew. Then is a segregation in Israel itself, not apartheid, and you cannot compare it to the apartheid. I mean, I'm speaking about the Israeli state. The one I finished the question, you want to stop me? with the most difficult question of boycott? <laughs> okay, stop me. Where we go? Stop me, it's better, it's better. I don't, you see. I just would like to point out there's lots of hands up so we can make your answers a bit short. Okay, I should be short, you see. I'm not for boycott of Israel. Don't thank me. Fight against the racism in Israel. Don't thank me, mister. Now, one moment. I'm not for a boycott of universities. And this is your question because it will be a little bit paradoxical that the university that pay me to, to speak, even in New York, that I will boycott it. What is my opinion about pressure against Israel to go out from all the occupied territories? I accept everything. You understand? Any means to make pressure on Israel to go out from the occupied territories is legitimate in my eyes. Not killing children and women, but I'm speaking any other pressure is legitimate in my eyes to force Israel to go out from all occupied territories. Okay. I will stop with it. He asked me to be shorter. That's Forward. Forward. Because uh, they are clever guys. It's a difference between proposing to Israel to become a non-racist state or to propose the, the Jewish Israelis to become from a day to tomorrow a minority in their state. You understand it? Yeah. Now, you wanted to ask what is my opinion to the one state solution. This is the question? I could ask that too, yes. <laughs> no, you asked this. You asked exactly this. But you are a very clever and very nice guy. You didn't put the question to me. No, uh, you see, I think that the uh, one state solution, this talkie in New York, ethically, is very good. I hope to live in one state with the Arabs. Politically, I think it's not clever to put it forward as a political program today. A lot of students of mine understand the other ones are for the one state solution. I think that we have to concentrate all our force to the troops from the occupied territories and to build two states for two societies. But the day that we arrive to two out the Israelis from the occupied territories, it has to be the day to start a fight to create a confederation between an Israeli state and a Palestinian state. Because we cannot live without Palestinian in the Middle East. And if a Jew don't want to live with Arabs in the Middle East, I give him the choice to come to New York. <laughs> I know, this is the reason that I say New York. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious what you think about Israel Shahak's work, Jewish history, Jewish religion, because in it, 
he makes the argument that it's the logic of the religion to exclude others and to develop this sort of idea that the logic of the religion is the logic of Zionism and that it's an exclusive one. And to follow that line, you haven't talked very much about the way that the Israeli state and Israeli culture is about the annihilation of diasporic cultures, the assault on Yemeni identity, the assault on Sephardic identities. And the I understood the question. Yeah. Be short, huh? Very short. <laughs> I don't accept the theory of Israel, Israel Shahak, a great moral person mm. that died. Yeah. But he was a physician, no, a chemist. A chemist. Chemist. Chemist, chemist. oh, chemie. <laughs> chemist, sorry. He was a chemist, not a historian. I agree one thing, the Zionism took from Jewish religion the worst part of isolation. But the Jewish religion, it's a lot of other things. You understand me? And I have another attitude to Jewish religion and to Zionism. Zionism is not a religious, a Jewish religion. By the way, it's a contradiction to the, to the Jewish religion. At all, with a lot of this. This, I think that Shahak was a very nice person, but a bad historian. Other questions? Okay, here, um, I want to ask you uh, about linguistic analysis. Yeah. You had my book? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> no. Not yet. Because I answer in the book about this question. We can make it shorter? No, I will answer very, very, because it's a, it's a very complicated question. The Yiddish has nothing to do with the Western Jewish-German language. Nothing to do. A part of the Yiddish is based on the Eastern German. In East Germany, they were not Jews. The question is why they, spo they are speaking uh, Yiddish is very complicated. There is a few explanations. Uh, in my book, I base myself on the works of Paul Wexler. You can even this week, uh, this evening, to go to the library to read his books. The Yiddish language is based on the Eastern German language. You see, not on the Jewish German of the Western, between Strasbourg and Metz, Kellen and uh, all this area. You understand me? There is not any evidence that wa it was emigration from West to East. In the final thing about all this question is, how come? I'm sure that in some stage of development, the guys from the East ask rabbis from Germany to come to help them. Because Germany was higher level culturally. You understand me? In the book, I'm sorry that I cannot make it uh, too long, in my book I try to explain this question basing myself about the works of a few linguists and also of a few, a few evidence. I know if somebody knows the name of Ribal. Rival, Rival, R-E-B-L. You heard about it? He's one of the first uh, very important Jew in, the, in Russia that, you know, was a, a very, very enlightened intellectual. He said in Russia in the 17th century, people didn't speak Yiddish exactly. Now, about changing in the 17th century, he said, yes, he said that in 17th, most of them didn't speak in Russia Yiddish. Now, one thing is important. You know the population can change in one or two generations a language? You know it? Yeah. You are the poor. Yes. Okay. Another question. Is, uh, 
Buy the book. You want it, I will buy for you because it's a very good question. No, really. Okay. Yeah, there is word. Like the most important word in the Jewish religion is to... What is the most important? Davenin. Davenin. You know a little bit Yiddish? You know, you know what is Davenin? The Red Yiddish? Abyssal. Davenin is to, uh, to pray. It's a Turkish basic. No. In your life. But in your consideration, which I, it seems to me is. The you only, stand up, sorry, excuse me, so you hear better than that. It seems to me that in your solution of the confederation, right, uh, that's the only solution now, but will, will, will it still be a Jewish state? Because you can't have a democracy, American state. No, no. Me, if, if, if it's a religious state. A Jewish state cannot be confederate with the Palestinian state. A Israeli state, a state of the Israeli citizens can be confederate. I mean, today I'm fighting against the principle of Jewish state because I am sure that it will destroy the Israeli state. You have to understand it. Then I repeat and I say the confederation will be between an Israeli state a Palestinian state, and I think also a Jordan state, because most of the citizens in Jordan, the subject in Jordan, are Palestinian. So a very nice large state, no? Confederation, sorry. So there will be Israel, will be Jewish, and Jordan, and Palestine will be Islam? Mm. What is to mean Jewish? I am a Jewish? My culture is Jewish? It's another discussion. What is the meaning of Jewish culture? What is the meaning? Really the meaning? You understand me? Ah, I know a lot of people is in the world don't like We them. have a Jewish secular culture in the world that unified the Jew? You, we have it? You understand that there, you cannot speak about a, a Jewish culture from a secular point of view. You can't speak the, about any of it without addressing anti Semitism. You what? Done Sorry? Done. I didn't. I didn't understand. Slowly, slowly. You see, I, it's... Okay, um, well, two questions. One, stand up and state your question. Okay, one, uh, just in general, I'm wondering why you chose to hold this forum at a time where more observant Jews couldn't necessarily come to contribute to the discussion. That was my, that was my most of our meetings are private. This is just okay, very, very, that's fine, but I, I wonder why most of them are on Friday, what that implicitly is doing to who's being able to come and speak. Two. <laughs> well, well, one moment, this is uh, a... <laughs> decision, and okay. it's the way Marxists prepare for the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I, guess, I guess Marx, Marx wasn't a very religious Jew, is what you're getting at. Um, two, or um, um, how do you... Two, how do you feel this discussion adds to <coughs> continuing discussions of the reduction of racism, anti-Semitism, and addressing issues such as Jewish self-hatred, which has been addressed by multiple authors? Uh, my most interesting read thus far is by Sandra Gilman. Um, what is the question, by the way? What you ask me? I'm asking how do you think this discussion is impacting the way people view discussions about surrounding racism? anti-Semitism and the resolution of these problems. Okay. <laughs> With the things that you heard this evening, mm -hmm. by the way, yesterday it was meeting also on the book, it didn't come. The Brecht Forum organized the, the evening. It wasn't Friday yesterday. Mm -hmm. Did you have a lot of people come who were observing? Yesterday? No, because it didn't come. <laughs> now. I, I, I'm obviously observing because I'm here it, right now. I want to know if it's clear that I'm an anti-racist, anti-anti-semitic I try to prove in the book the Jew were in, Af in North Africa before the Arabs yeah. I try to prove in my book the Jew were in France before the Frank invasion I, I try to prove in my book and this is the reason that it is going to be translated to Russian that the Jew were in Kiev in Ukraine before the Russian I'm anti-semitic? No Now I am not also a self-hatred Jew you know why? Look at me. 
<laughs> you think that I ha have hate against myself? No. Not at all. You have to know me a little bit better it's to understand yourself, it. It's your people. Which people? <laughs> the Israeli people? Jewish people, the culture. But it doesn't exist. How I can hate something that doesn't exist? a joke. It's not a joke. Really, I'm not joking. Now, the other parts, I want to say that the Jewish in North Africa, it's a, it's a product of uh, mass conversion. Very, very early uh, conversion I, I, I'm speaking about in my book. You see, it's amazed me that a lot of Jews in Israel are sure that they are the direct descendant of David the, the, the king. Only the Ethiopian, you know, the Ethiopian, they, you know, they look at them, there is a kind of racism against the black Jew, you know. Because they know that it's not possible that they are descendant of David uh, the king, you understand? Jewish in Ethiopia are a product of conversion and exactly like in Poland, the Polish, the Ashkenaz, become very, very angry at me. This is about the question. The Jew, most of the Jew, are a product of conversion, mass conversion, and I come to this in details in this in my book. It's very difficult to discuss against me, uh, develop a discussion against me about these points in my book. Unless you look at genetic history. Excuse me, sorry. What was your second question? I will leave you, a religious person, the biologically. I will leave you biologically explanation, legitimation of Jewishness. I think that it's a shame for a Jew that was born in the 20th century. We are all born in the 20th century. It's a shame for a Jew that was born in the 20th century to base his identity on biology. Now. Sorry? Ah, it, it was very well. I mean, Zionist historians become very, very angry. They don't speak with me. But the media received it very, very well. And I was in the list of the bestseller for 19 weeks. You see, it's not bad for a very difficult, yeah. boring book like my book. No, uh, uh, really. You know, it's not a, you know, it's not a thriller. In also in France, it was uh, sell very very good. You see, okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm wondering why you say that the Jewish state, as it's presently constituted, is for destruction. Uh, a state doesn't go by justice; it goes by power. People like Lieberman have the power, and they're gaining more and more power, as it seems to me. We can't predict the future. But why can't they simply eradicate? I will tell you. I will tell you. You see, predict the past, <laughs> but from time to time, no, I make an effort to predict the past. You see, all this book is imagination. You see, now the question: I, I'm not a prophet, but I know the stability of the state that is based on ethnic principle is a very weak state the contradiction become more and more strong. I see it before me with the young Arabs in Israel. You understand me? Gaza, Jenin, is nothing what can happen with the Arab Israelis when they will decide not to accept the Jewish state. 
Now, why I'm sure about it? Not only because of Kosovo, because I think something miraculous happened in the modern times. People are thinking that the state belongs to them, even if, if it always not belongs to them. But to give the illusion that the state belongs to you, it's a principle of modernity, political modernity. The principle that the people are equal before the politics, before the sovereignty, it's a principle of modern politics. Yes or not? You understand me? You don't have this principle, you are condemned in the state, like other states in the 20th century, that was ethnic state and not democratic state. I don't make analogy. I was thinking about Sri Lanka. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? John, you stand up. Many copies of the book. Saturated in Zionism out of here. <laughs> you know? That's a man out of here. No, I don't have I can hardly breathe. Yeah. I get so much Zionism. Right from the horse's mouth. Netanyahu, and then Father Netanyahu. We have one member of the the uh, cabinet after another. So it's very thorough. And then a lot of American uh, uh, American journalists and so forth who uh, also back them up. And uh, the okay. Okay. inside story. Right. And so forth. What I'm wondering is, uh, where are you going to be on the uh, Charlie Rose show? <laughs> <laughs> it's on that, it's public <laughs> the television that it's on. Public television, my dear. I don't know. Anyway, I have to tell you that the Israeli TV, the Israeli TV received me wonderfully. I was in uh, 11 missions in the TV in Israel. book appeared. And most of the journalists were very, very curious about the book. Okay, then... Uh, how is it? Here, no. I'm speaking a bad English. It's better now. The rest of my question was this. I'm an American, and that's how I post these things. And uh, as an American, I see that really quite a lot of money goes from here. Well, credits, not money. Go from here, first of all, to Israel. Secondly, to Egypt. For itself. Yes. Really. I can try to give a lecture about this, but it's too late. <laughs> It's very interesting. I will not come into the question. I will say one thing maybe about this. The destiny of Israel, the destiny of the area, of the Middle East, depend a lot on you, Americans. Not Americans. I will not put the question, I can't, to save us from yourself, for ourselves, okay? Save us. I'm not joking about yeah, it. Yeah. Okay, well, it's too long to answer. Yes, I'll read it. No, no, you can. Yes, Matt. You, have, you said before that we are, we are an American nation as opposed to the Jewish nation of Israel. The thing that binds us together as a nation is that we all watch the same television commercials. <laughs> That's pretty much about it. What about the idea of zero nations? Stop, just get rid of the idea of nationalism altogether in the way we approach things. So we approach things as a human community and stop. I don't really care whether Jews are a nation or not, whether Americans are a nation or French or Gauls are a nation. What relevant? Who cares? We're trying to create something different in our lives in this world, right? Tell it to the Palestinians. The Palestinians, they don't have a state. People that have a state, their own state, to fight to abolish states. But people that don't have state are obliged to fight for a state. You understand me? If you want really to know my opinion, I am a universalist. Being an Israeli is only the point of departure for me. My dream is a world without states, as you can imagine. 
I want a confederation, for example, of the Middle East. But you know, don't mix utopia, utopia with politics. It's very important. As I say and I insist, utopia has to direct politics, not to replace politics. It's too easy and too dangerous. Okay. The, you, he asked a question. No, there is others that... Did, well, make attention. I don't deny Jewish identity. I never fighting against identity of somebody. There is identity of the homosexuals. They are not a people. There is identity of beaten women, but it, they are not a people. Okay? We are composed with a lot of identities. Everybody. You understand? I'm not denying identities of people. I deny the pretension that the Jewish people exist because it's brought people to believe that they have land there. You understand me? I don't care about the world people. If you want, do it away. With one condition. Deeply speaking about a Jewish people is speaking about a people that has a land in the Middle East that Madoff, his real land is not here. This is the reason that he made what he made, maybe. No, you have to understand what I insist. I understand what you're One moment. I will be interpreted like people, you know, you know, you cannot dominate it. It's a kind of uh, regle de jeu. I mean, you have to, I know that I will be interpreted. This is the reason that I insist. The recognition of the Israeli people this is the reason that I insist politically to recognize the Israeli, the Israeli state. Not a Jewish state, the Israeli state. And I finish because I am very tired <laughs> with the one example. When I was in El Quds, you know, the Palestinian invited me to a Palestinian university after I published the book. They like very much the book. You can imagine. <laughs> Now, they invite me to a conference in El Quds University. Seren Seba invite me. And uh, I give the lecture, like uh, more or less better than today, because it was in Hebrew. They, by the way, they insist that I will speak in Hebrew because all the professors were ex-prisoners. <laughs> the student didn't understand, but the professor insists that I will speak in Hebrew because they were ex-prisoners that knew very well Hebrew. You understand me? After the lecture, they asked me, how, after this book, you can justify and demand, and demand us to recognize the Israeli state? And then I say that even a child that was born for, from a rape has the right to live. You understand me? 48 was a rape. But something happened in history. We have to correct, to correct, repair a lot of things. You understand me? The day after it, in the first Palestinian journal, the headline was, even a child that was born for a rape has the right to live. Thank you very much.